hello friends and welcome to Ask Zach. I'm guessing many of you have seen all these, uh, you know, it's, it's very hip right now to have these kind of what ifs or alternate realities where, you know, one thing has changed and everything else, you know, changes in the uh, timeline. There's one guitarist that if you removed him, uh, you wouldn't have Chet Atkins among many other guitar players. And just as significant, you probably wouldn't have the Fender Telecaster or the Stratocaster or the Gibson Les Paul guitars. That person that's such a linchpin in the history of guitar playing, of electric guitar playing, is Merle Travis. Merle Travis was a hugely influential guitarist, and he is mostly uncredited as to his importance in the birth of the solid body guitar. So we're going to rectify that today. We're also going to have a book nook segment in which we're going to talk about, uh, you know, a uh, very essential element and, uh, and research point for, uh, for this episode. And that's uh, the Merle Travis story by Merle Travis and Deke Dickerson. So... First off, I need to thank the sponsor of today's episode, True Fire. I love True Fire. They have the most amazing collection of artists that are teaching their lessons. And beyond that, they have the most fantastical and easy to use interface. Uh, pertaining to today's episode, they have a series with Tom Bresch, who of course is uh, Merle Travis's son. And he teaches, uh, the late Tom Bresch uh, taught an entire series on how to play like Merle Travis. So that's a, a wonderful thing. So if you're interested, use the uh, link down in the description and use the discount code AskZach30 to get 30% off. All right, let's dig in. So Merle Travis was born in Rosewood, Kentucky. That's in Muhlenberg County. And uh, some of you may know about Muhlenberg because of uh, the uh, John Prine tune, which is significant. Uh, but Muhlenberg County is actually more significant for its guitar players and the guitar style, the indigenous guitar style that came out of that area. So uh, Merle was born November 29th in 1917 there, and he grew up very poor, and he was surrounded by the Muhlenberg County guitar style, which was the use of a thumb pick and a single finger, and this was played by many of the coal miners, and they would uh, they would work in the coal mines, and then uh, on the evenings and uh, on weekends they would perform, and Merle absorbed this style, learned a lot of the tunes, and he decided he wasn't going to be a coal miner he decided that he was going to be a full-time entertainer. And so he uh, learned, and probably the two best known and, and I guess most important uh, you know, players of this style that Merle learned from were Mose Rager and Ike Everly. Of course, Ike Everly was the, uh, the father of the Everly brothers. And so he learned the Muhlenberg County guitar style, which was playing the bass line with your thumb and then adding kind of rhythm and melody using your, your first finger. And so that's the, that's the style and that's the way everyone played, just using the thumb and a single finger. It wasn't until later, you know, guys like Chet Atkins and others started adding in other fingers to the style. But uh, yeah, Merle was the guy that uh, got out and took the style of guitar playing to the rest of the country. So first he started kind of touring regionally and he started kind of ex expanding, you know, beyond that. He, uh, he was one of the first country performers to uh, add a pickup to his archtop guitar. So he got a DeArmond floating pickup in 1939 and added it on and making him one of the earlier electric guitar players. Of course, that was after Charlie Christian, but probably one of the earlier uh, country music, you know, performers that was using the electric guitar with an amplifier and continued to kind of do that, that thing and tour and play on, on, you know, live radio. 
And where his career really gets into high gear is when he gets tired of that area of the country, the central United States and the, and the kind of the South that he's been touring in, he decides to leave and go out to the land of promise, which is California. And this is in the, in the 1940s. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, um, California at that time was really seen as the real land of opportunity in the U.S. Uh, throughout the, uh, the depression of the 1930s, um, many immigrants, many, uh, many from Oklahoma, Okies, Arkies from Arkansas, all you know, were, uh, were starving to death and they all moved out to, uh, to California to work in the fields, usually picking uh, you know, vegetables, fruit, whatever it was. And, uh, and then even into the 1940s, it continued to be kind of the land of opportunity because of all the defense plants that uh, were, were built up during the Second World War. And so there were jobs, there was um, money to be made, and uh, there, there was just, again, opportunity in California. So during the Second World War, um, you know, he, uh, he moves out, you know, Merle Travis moves out to California, and because the defense plants are running like two and three shifts, uh, there's always, you know, people wanting to blow off steam after working in the plant, and they want to, you know, drink beer and uh, dance and uh, listen to good country music. And so that's what Merle did. He, uh, he entertained the, uh, the hardworking people that were, uh, you know, helping with the war effort. So uh, once the, the war ends, he continues to perform, be, starts being on you know, live radio shows, which were kind of a staple during that period of time, and also ends up with a recording contract with a young upstart uh, label called Capitol Records. Uh, it's hard to think of it that way, but uh, you know, just a, a, few, a decade or two earlier, you know, we th we think of Capitol Records like in the '60s because the Beach Boys and the Beatles and and other groups or Merle Haggard and Buck Owens, but uh, you know, in the in the 1940s, Capitol was a uh, you know a small label that was you know kind of getting off the ground, and so Merle was signed to Capitol, and he. Uh, he recorded an album called Songs from the Hills, and it was him doing uh, folk songs or things that, uh, or songs that he'd written that sounded like folk songs. And uh, probably one of the most important songs that ended up on that album was 16 Tons, which is an incredibly important tune and, of course, has been covered many, many times through the years. I guess the biggest hit was Tennessee Ernie Ford. But, uh, yeah. Merle was continuing to advance as a guitarist, you know, learning to play you know, instrumentals, you know, getting better and better at his guitar style. He was getting better and better as a songwriter. He was also writing tunes like Smoke, Smoke, Smoke That Cigarette, which was a hit for uh, Tex Williams, or even uh, one of my favorite tunes, Sweet Temptation, that uh, he recorded and, of course, was later recorded by Ricky Skaggs in the 70s. And, uh, you know, then uh, he, during this time, he also began to be dissatisfied with his Gibson archtop that he had put the Dearman pickup on. So he had been using it all that time. So he was using this uh, Gibson L10 with the Dearman pickup into one of those old Gibson uh, EH amplifiers, kind of like the one Charlie Christian used. So he began to see the steel guitar players that he was playing with and he saw that uh, they didn't have problems with feedback and they had you know longer they had much more sustain than he had and he uh, he noticed that uh, there was a steel player who was one of the greats uh, named Joaquin Murphy and uh, Joaquin Murphy had a steel guitar that was built by a motorcycle enthusiast named Paul Bigsby. So Merle and Paul meet somehow, probably through their uh, both loved motorcycle racing, and they uh, Merle begins, you know, talking about having a solid body guitar built. Again, this is in 1947, 
And now there were some interesting solid bodies made by Slingerland and, uh, and also from Rickenbacker, but all of them had like really small bodies and they, they weren't really, uh, they didn't look <laughs> really like a guitar or, or they had like a really small, strange body. So Merle drew out a, uh, you know, what, he, what he wanted. And one of the things he was adamant about was he wanted the, all the machine heads, all the tuners, he wanted them to be on one side. He wanted six in a line tuners because he didn't like going back and forth when he was, you know, tuning or stringing up a guitar. So he made this drawing. It was crude, uh, and it's in the book that uh, you, you, should, uh, you should check it out. And, you know, Paul takes this crude drawing and turns it into an instrument. And it's made of bird's eye maple. It has a six on a headstock tuner, but it has kind of a strange looking headstock that's kind of, uh, you know, overly large. So Paul ends up cutting it down into, of course, what we think of as the Bixby headstock, a.k.a. the uh, Strat headstock. Uh, again, this is in 1947. Um, Merle begins performing with the instrument, and he, he likes it, but he still ends up recording more with his Gibson L10. There are some recordings of him using the Bixby instrument, but he, he still kind of liked the, uh, the arch top with the pickup sound. So while he's performing with this uh, Bigsby solid body guitar, you know, probably, uh, I, I can't think of anyone else because, I mean, Les Paul was using the log, which was just solid down the middle and hollow, hollow on the sides, or he's using his clunkers, which were those instruments that had thick tops on them, but were still hollow body instruments. Uh, this is really, I think, the first you know big performer because you have to remember Merle was on Capitol Records and he was on radio, and he was really the first person to popularize the solid body electric guitar. Now here's where things get really good. A man comes out to one of Merle's shows, and his name is Leo Fender. Leo Fender asks to borrow the Bigsby guitar. He brings it back a week later, and he shows his version of the instrument. And we don't know exactly what it was, but I mean, it could have been one of the snakehead ones, or you know, one of one of the early versions of the of the the singular dual pickup Esquire. So. Uh, now, I guess let's just cut to the chase. Was the Fender guitar an exact copy of the Bigsby instrument? No, but it was hugely influenced by it. And I think it's unfortunate that uh, Merle and Paul have kind of been in some ways written out of the history books. Now, part of it has to do with evidently uh, once Fender started having a lot of success, um, Paul Bigsby evidently sued Fender and lost. And I think this is where we get the story that Leo would tell over and over again when asked about the Bigsby instrument. He would say, oh, I had seen it, but it was really Croatian instruments with six on a side tuners. And uh, I'm sorry, I've seen the pictures of these Croatian instruments. And I'll bet you a million dollars that, uh, you know, Leo Fender didn't have access to a Croatian you know, instrument. I think that's what a lawyer uh, was able to use as a, a way of undermining what, uh, you know, Paul was asserting in the lawsuit. So, yeah, I, and I think it's just unfortunate that uh, Bigsby and Merle Travis are not really given the, the credit they deserve. And, and am I trying to argue for any type of monetary thing? No, I'm just arguing for the due credit that uh, Paul and Merle deserve for their huge influence on the Esquire broadcaster, Telecaster, and of course the Strat when Leo went full on and used you know, a, uh, a variation of the Bigsby headstock. And you know what I said earlier about the Gibson Les Paul, well, if it hadn't been for the uh, for the you know broadcaster telecaster and its 
popularity and its, its growth and its sales, there'd be no Gibson Les Paul guitar. You know, because again, that was an instrument that Gibson came up with. Les Paul had nothing to do with that instrument except for insisting that that awful uh, tailpiece go on it. And I think the color. But otherwise, you know, that was an instrument that Gibson had already developed and it was in response to Fender's instrument, which of course existed because of, you know, Leo Fender going and seeing Merle Travis perform. So, uh, I guess also we'll just go ahead and mention that, uh, of course, if you guys like the Bigsby vibrato, well, guess what? It wouldn't be there if it weren't for Merle Travis. So Merle Travis was using the Kaufman vibrato, which instead of going up and down like we're used to, it went sideways, kind of like the sideways vibrola that Gibson used in the 60s. And it was terrible and it didn't stay in tune. And uh, Merle kind of challenged Paul Bigsby. And he said, I bet you can't make a better, you know, vibrato than this. And he said, you know, of course, responded in, you know, the typical, you know, I know you can't. Yes, I can. You know, he said, absolutely, I can do it. And he did. And so the Bigsby vibrato exists because of Merle Travis. It was because he wanted a vibrato that stayed in tune better than the Kaufman and also went up and down as far as, you know, pressing up and down instead of sideways. And uh, it's been quite popular and uh, yeah, so that's another way in which we need to give Merle credit. So there are some other really interesting things and I don't want to you know give away all the fun stuff that's in uh, Deke's book, but uh, there's some fun stuff where Merle did uh, some of the Les Paul things that, that he's known for, you know, such as sped up guitars where Merle did it beforehand, and that Merle actually dated Mary Ford, then known as Colleen Summers, before she ended up with Les. So there's a lot of uh, really interesting stuff in in the book, and so let's just go ahead and uh, and 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 plug the book. So Deke Dickerson is one of my favorite writers, and he's also a wonderful performer, and he uh, met with. Uh, Merle's uh, daughters, and they ended up uh, showing him the documents, the uh, the writings that Merle had done. Merle had basically started writing an autobiography. So every chapter of this book starts off with Merle's writings about a certain time period, and then Deke will kind of take things apart, expound upon them, and also talk about things that Merle has glossed over. And so you learn all sorts of wonderful things about Merle. This is, this is a wonderful book. It has wonderful pictures of, you know, the Bigsby guitar in, in various states. And, uh, and these are books that aren't anywhere else on the internet. And uh, that's why, you know, I'm not gonna post them here because I think you need to buy this book. So it's a uh, wonderful, uh, lovingly well-written book. I highly recommend it. There's a link in the description uh, to Amazon, you know, like Amazon affiliate, but also I've put a link to uh, Deke's website so that if you want to order a signed copy so you can get, you know, those signed by Deke Dickerson. All right, let's talk about the Merle Travis guitar album and let's talk a little bit about the super, the famous Super 400. So, of course, Merle played the Bigsby guitar, but kind of kept recording mostly with his Gibson L10 with the DeArmin pickup on it. And then in 1952, he ordered his famous Super 400 guitar with his name in the neck and all the bling and everything else. And this blew me out of the water because I knew that guitar had to have been very expensive. He paid $1,070 in 1952 for the guitar. Taking inflation into account, that's you know probably over ten thousand dollars in today's money. So uh, yeah, so guy goes into a Gibson you know dealer and uh, orders a you know orders a guitar for ten thousand dollars. So that's what uh, that's what Merle did, and so he had that uh, beautiful you know fifty two Super four hundred with those wonderful Alnico pickups, and of course the Bigsby vibrato, which he had the first one. And that's what he made what 
I think is the best instrumental guitar album of all time, especially if you take into account a clean tone. And it is the most beautiful clean tone there has ever been recorded. This is the album, Merle, the Merle Travis guitar. And so this was a result of uh, Ken Nelson, who of course, a lot of you might know him for from producing Buck Owens and Merle Haggard and such. Well, also he was you know, at Capitol before that. And he also produced you know, and, and worked with uh, Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West. Well, Jimmy Bryant and Speedy West had had some success on Capitol with their instrumentals. And Ken thought it'd be a great idea for Merle, who of course is a wonderful guitar player, to do an instrumental album. Because mainly before that, he had been doing uh, you know, songs where he was singing and, and playing guitar to back himself up and wasn't really featuring his guitar playing. So he uh, convinced Merle to do it. And so in Hollywood, California, they recorded the Merle Travis guitar. And it most of the cuts are just him playing guitar by himself. And they are just the most jaw-dropping, beautiful playing and tone and tunes you're ever gonna hear. And uh, I, I love this album. And uh, it shocked me, uh, but also made sense when uh, in, in Deke's book, he says that it was recorded direct. So there was a engineer at Capitol there in Hollywood named John Krause, and he recorded it. And Merle tried to replicate that tone many times you know, through the years, and he was never able to get that same sound. So... This is a must have. So I, I highly recommend that you find it either digitally or, uh, or of course, vinyl. And uh, you know, mine's a, a later reissue, probably you know, from the uh, late 60s, early 70s. But it's, uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful album. I love Merle Travis. I love his style of guitar playing. I, uh, I love the thump of his playing. I, I just, I love everything about it. And I hope that you will take the time. I hope that you will get Deke's book. And if, if you don't do that, I hope that you will listen to the Merle Travis guitar album. And uh, I'll put links and such in the description. All right, guys. Well, I really appreciate you uh, listening and watching today. And I'll see you next time. And thank you again to Truefire for sponsoring today's episode. Again, Use the link uh, and ask Zach30 to get 30% off. All right. Bye-bye.